hear me? Can you hear me okay? No. No. Okay. Is that better? Good. Is that good enough? Yes. Okay. 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 Now. Now? Yes. Okay. In the back, you can hear me? No. All right. Thank you very much. One other piece of paper I'd like to mention is that this is our free newsletter. So if you're interested in getting this free newsletter, please put your name at the bottom of our evaluation. You can tell which one. It says 2017 exit evaluation. And we'll get that to you. We prefer to do it online, or we can do it by snail mail. Okay? So we'd like to do that. Now, are you ready for this program? Yes. And you can see that it's radio, WDKY. traditional landscape because you know if you go into a new development 
It's the same plant material in the same place on each house. Okay? Do you agree? Yeah. Okay. So you see this one, it's four trees, 55 plants. So that's only one tree species and two plant species. Now it's not the number of plants, it's the different kinds of plants. Are you with me on that? That's where the diversity comes in. <clears throat> so here is the same landscape that has been created into Florida Friendly. Look at the difference in plant diversity. The more trees, more plants, you have six tree species and 18 plant species. Now maybe that's a little more than you want to do as far as extra plant material. But you can see the difference between the traditional when you only have two plant species and here where you have 18 plant species, six tree species, okay? What else do you think is happening when you put in that diversity? What else is going to happen in your landscape? I already mentioned it just a second ago as one of the principles. Rainwater. Wild, rainwater, but wildlife. Wildlife. We do need to attract the wildlife. <clears throat> so what do you know about reducing maintenance? Is there anybody who doesn't want to reduce maintenance? <laughs> I don't think so. I think we all do. Well, number one, we already talked about reducing the lawn, okay? Want to use mulches, because mulches will do a lot of things for you, and think about it, because I'm going to ask you in a minute to give me an answer on mulches. Ground covers and using low maintenance plants. There are low maintenance plants. I didn't say no maintenance, I said <laughs> low maintenance, okay? <clears throat> Which one of these mulches would be better, the organic or the inorganic? <laughs> organic. Why? Because it's down. down. Can you name three benefits of mulch? Water for weeds. Weeds. Holds in the moisture. Holds in the moisture. I'm sorry. It's organic material. Okay, I have nine reasons here, and my headset's going to fall off, so let's just take it off. Retards, retains moisture, retards weeds, provides nutrients, controls erosion, insulates soil from extreme temperatures. See, that's another one. Improves plant performance, eases maintenance, adds beauty to the landscape as well, because you know, a well mulch uh, yard looks very nice. And here's one you're not thinking about protects your trees from the tree stringers, the, the weeders. Well, look how many times that you can mess up one of your trees if you use the weed eater too close to it. So, let's do that question. Sure. What is gravel? Like, I mean, what pebbles? What pebbles? Not again. I mean, because they don't break down. <clears throat> See, they're going to let you know. That's the reason they're inorganic. Pebbles and like your rubber mulches, they're not great in the natural. I mean, it's a matter of choice. No, I would, they're not saying it's, it's a matter of choice what you want to use. But we're saying that the organics is better because it amends the soil, breaks down, and it does better for the soil. And also, along another line, what you're using a lot of times as the organic matter, it's helping you to recycle because you are using some of the pine needles, maybe some of the pine bark, some of the limbs that have been ground up, that are on your property, so you're actually recycling at the same time, which is another good Florida friendly trend. Did that answer your question? Yes, ma'am, thank you. Okay. Now, did, what do you know about uh, energy efficiency when you think about your landscape? You wouldn't think of deciduous trees, would that be true? Because deciduous trees are gonna help you stay warmer in the winter. And in the summer, they're going to help you stay cooler. And especially deciduous trees over an air conditioner area because it's going to help just to shade your air conditioner a bit. What's the downside here? Leaves falling. Leaves falling. Okay. Leaves falling. We've got to wait a long time for it to grow. Okay. What I'm thinking is you all have established landscapes, right? 
Yeah. And so it's kind of hard to change the tree situation. If it's a new landscape, or if you're younger than me, you're going to live long enough for the see the tree grow up. Right? <laughs> so that's, that can be a problem. But look at what you're saving. $73 of AC, $75 of erosion control. It makes a wildlife shelter and, and the air pollution reduction. I mean, so the benefit of trees, they're great. Even though, yes, they will drop their leaves, use the leaves as mulch, uh, recycle, compost. So, you know, it's, it's continuing life. Now, what do you know about conserving water? Number one, here's that long question again. Reduce the lawn to a functional amount. What the heck would be a functional amount? Enough to keep it alive. Enough to keep it alive. Okay, think about what you do. This is not a one size fits all. Think about what you do. You have grandchildren over, you want to have a little play area for them. Does your HOA tell you that you have to have 95% of St. Augustine grass? When you have that, then you can't quite get around it. Uh, you might have a dog, <coughs> and a dog needs some landscaping, some area like that, okay? So think about what your situation is. Maybe you like to entertain in a little area in the back of the yard. So you want some grass. So think about the functional amount. But nobody really needs a front lawn the size of the golf course. Agree? <laughs> Okay, you're going to water it as needed, and I bet how many of you have your your sprinkler set on automatic? Is that a good thing? Is it rain? Is that a good thing to have on automatic? Then you're putting it on manual. That's a circuit breaker. Rain with sprinklers is blowing my crazy. Water, water as needed, and. I mean, no, we're having rain now, so, in, and you have certain watering days, and you all know what they are. I, I can tell this is an intelligent group. I know that you know your days, right? <laughs> but really, think about it. If it's raining, you don't need as much water, so put it on manual. And then learn to read the leaves. All the time. See, that's what this is about. Can you really explain that? <laughs> sure. Leaves both. Just saying, obviously, grass and both of them. Yeah, learn to read the leaves. It's going to have a bluish color. The leaves are going to fold. I have another slide, but not here with me. But one of that's the other slide says the blades of grass are out like this. That means uh, it's watered. It's it's comfortable. It's happy. It's had a good drink. And then as it starts to dry out, those blades start to come up. Okay. And then by the time they get here and and they don't have no water, then they start to hurt themselves because now they're trying to conserve what moisture that they have. So you, you really need to learn to read the grass, and you can. Another thing that you need to do when it really gets in drought, dry conditions, it's going to crack, and your footprints are going to stay when you walk on the grass. So that's another. Okay, so those, those are the, the ways that you, you can tell. But most people, yes ma'am. I think I've seen the blue color. It's blue, it's just not going to be, it's not going to be a color of Terry's shirt or anything. It's, it's just going to have a bluish tint. Yeah. But watch for those blades to fold up a little bit. That's how they're trying to conserve the moisture. Oh, soil moisture sensors are expensive. Most people don't have those that are in the ground. And it'll tell you, you know, how much rain it'll shut off in your system. And I have given you I believe you got the little card that shows the ordinances, the fertilizer, and the water. Calibrating sprinklers. Now I want to see how many liars you have to <laughs> Who has calibrated their sprinklers? Well, we got two, two honest people. <laughs> In your packet, you will see that there is a handout on how to calibrate sprinklers. What in the world is the benefit of calibrating your sprinklers? You're going to save water. You're going to save money by not putting out as much water. Because, listen carefully, you only need a half to three quarters of an inch of water. Okay? You don't need water to go all the way down below the root zone of your, of your grass. 
for your plans. <coughs> so calibrate the sprinklers and you have that and Marie Crow's handing it out now. So you try that when you get home. That's exactly how to do it. And then of course separate lawns and bed as far as your sprinkler system. Have micro in the beds and your your regular setup in your lawns. Alright, here I've already said to measure this is you want to use the same size cans and pack cans, cut food cans or tin cans will work well. And if anybody needs a cat or two, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm feeding 16 little barrel things. And they don't all get wet food, but you need cat food cans I have. But this tells you how to do it and you now have the hand out. So separate the zones using the micro or the drip on your plant beds. And then also think about rain gardens. Very nice. I know what they're thinking. Rain gardens. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're thinking? No? You know what a rain garden is. Okay. You don't know what a rain garden is. Don't know what a rain garden is. Is there any place in your lawn where the water and the rain will stay for longer than other times. Okay, so it's called so a mosquito breeder. It's called a mosquito breeder. That's an excellent spot for a rain garden. Now, what a rain garden really is, it's just a small depression in your yard, three to six inches, no more than eight inches deep. And you're going to put plant material in there. And, and if anybody needs a list of, of adequate and the best type of plant material, send me an email, okay? That's epanko at coj.net. We'll tell you that again, and it's probably on one of the that. But a rain garden is going to hold in, listen, 30% more rain in your yard, rather than running off and down into the stormwater, okay? Because what happens when it's running off? It's, what's it taking with it? It's taking the nutrients, taking the fertilizer, the pesticides, dog waste, anything that shouldn't be. Right. But the rain garden, it's, a, it's really very simple, just a small depression. You can create them, even though you don't have any, anything like that right now, but you can create them. And so what your idea is to keep more rainwater on your lawn. Make sense? And this is showing what it does, it's filtering the, the blues. But they can be very attractive, and they don't have to be large. That's another whole presentation as far as creating rain gardens. <coughs> How about rain barrels? Who has rain barrels? Can't have them? I have them in Kansas City. I have them on every style. That's great. Well, you can, you can still have them here. I, just moved here two years ago, so I'm still getting pizzas. Okay. Uh, by the way, next week I'm having uh, what we call Camp Florida Friendly, and we are having a rain drought class. It's yesterday was the deadline. However, if you were interested in coming to that rain drought class, and to, if we do make and take, you would have to give me money tonight because I'm ordering the barrels tomorrow, just to give you information. And I have also a little trifold on our camp Florida friendly, but all yesterday was deadline. If anybody's interested, let, let me uh, talk to me after so that I can give you one of the brochures and you would have to pay me tonight for it to, to work, okay? But what do we do with a rain barrel if it doesn't rain? Fill it up and, and use it as a little drip line for some of your plant beds, right? So when we were going through the the drought, what, two or three, four weeks ago? Then that was what we were instructing people. And now we're having rain, so if we have rain, look how much we're saving. In a peak season, you can save 1,300 gallons of rainwater. And that certainly is a good, good thing when it comes to what you're paying for the JEA water. Yes, ma'am. Do you have to have a gutter and a downspout? No, ma'am. I don't. No. In our classes, we teach you and we set the rain barrels up because it's what I say, make and take. You actually go home with a rain barrel and the way we make them is you can use them in a gutter or not in, with gutters. 
Yes. Another thing most people don't think about, and all, a lot of us have dehumidifiers. Nothing in the radio. Absolutely. The other thing that we teach you in our class is how to handle the mosquito situation. See, and so when she was talking about the rain guards are mosquito, you know, the, where the standing water is, then we can, if you plant that and you don't have standing water, the water's percolating in, then you're, you're saving the mosquito situation. But as far as standing water, you, nobody wants standing water because the mosquito right now in particular. But it, it, I will tell you, if you go to Lowe's or Home Depot or one of the nursery stores and buy the mosquito dunks, you familiar with them? Okay, and they also have the granules now as well. But that's organic. It's not going to hurt your dog. It's not going to hurt a bird. It's not going to hurt your plants. And you can break off pieces and put the plants off, sir. Yes? Um, my question is, is it safe with the monitors? Yes, it's organic. It's not going to okay. hurt. It's not going to hurt. Because I know there are a lot of things, even though they're organic. No. Okay. It's BT bacillus thereogenesis alone. I said that right. It's cursive. It's a different formulation. Yeah. Okay, so it doesn't it doesn't capture the white No. Got it. Okay. If you want to know some more about rain barrel stuff, um, you can look it up. Yes, ma'am. I think you a factor to us a favor and repeat the question that somebody is giving me because I'm sorry. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. And then I was asking if it would if the uh, BT or the mosquito dumps would hurt the monarch butterfly. The answer is no, and that's my fault. I should have been repeating that. No, that's okay. And also, you said mosquito dunk? Mosquito dunk. Yes, they look like donuts. They look, they look like donuts. And you can break off pieces. See, in our rain barrel classes, we teach you to, you can drop one in the top of the rain barrel, and then as the water goes down, it's going to dissolve for a period of time. I don't know, maybe a month. We'll keep one. But it, uh, for the classes, I usually get them at Lowe's and it's six to a package and it's about ten dollars. But they will go along with the things about your bird bath, the things about your dog water, any place where you have a uh, saucer under your plate. Okay, so that's something you really should have. Did you have a question? Okay, okay what do you know about reducing? Size. Who can now no master gardener answer this please? <laughs> We're gonna practice IPM. What are we gonna do? No idea. <laughs> okay, so I here's the situation. She doesn't know and I'm just picking on you, so <laughs> she doesn't know, so what she's gonna do if she sees her bottom is what? Get out the old spray can. <laughs> Right? That's what she's going to do. Now, what you going to do? <laughs> IPM is integrated pest management. In a nutshell, what that means is we let the good guys take care of the bad guys. Because you see, there are more good guys out there than bad guys. You just have to know who they are, so identification is extremely important, right? Okay. Most insects are harmful and they should be removed from your yard. And what's the name of this bug? It's a damsel bug. Damsel. And it's a good bug. Okay. So you want to think about spot treatment. Not overall, no blanket. And tolerance has to be. Come on. We have to tolerate some things. We're not going to have a perfect yard all the time unless you're doing artificial flowers. Right? So, I'm going to test you. Can you name that bug? Lady bug. Okay, number two. If you don't, is it good or bad? Okay, let's, number two is this one. Is it good or bad? Bad? I heard bad. Looks bad. Looks bad. <laughs> See, you go by what, it, what you think. Okay, this is actually 
the larva of the ladybug, and it's as good as the ladybug. And ladybug is the most beneficial insect in the forest, right? <laughs> All right, number three. The earwig. So it's, the earwig. it's the earwig. Is that good or bad? Yeah, it's a <laughs> Okay, listen carefully. That earwig can eat 60 chinch bugs a night. And so, I don't know who's that, I can count them, but... <laughs> but when he's in the house, he's not so good. No. All right, quickly. This one, Tara keep me on time. You watch it. This one, good or bad? Good. It is good, but you don't know what it is, right? Oh, you just figure, okay, it's a little good trail. Uh, it's a green lace wing. This one? That's another one that looks bad, but it's actually the larva of a green lace wing. So oh. it's a good guy. And how about five or six? He looks bad too, doesn't he? They all look bad. This is a good guy as well. And it's called the big guy bug. You see those great big guys there? All right, how about here? You know these ones. Yes. And this one? White fly. White fly. Good or bad? Bad. How about this guy? It is good. I think that was a guess. I think it's good. It's an assassin bug. Yeah, now he's a good guy, but be careful. Don't try to pick him up because he's going to bite you. I will. Okay, so we have to move on. What do you know about reducing waste? What can we do to reduce the waste in the yard? We can recycle. We can compost. Boy, that's one of the, my favorite topics is composting and work composting. And we have a class on that next week as well. So don't throw anything. Don't put your bags out on, on the front uh, for the garbage people to take them. Reuse the, the yard material. Okay? Just recycle and reuse. It's going to save you money. Don't send this to the landfill. We have work to do. Every weekday, Duval adds 500 to 600 tons of yard waste to the landfill. Now, doesn't that make you feel sad? Sure. Because yeah. look at the landfills building up, where you could be using that material and actually amending your own soil, see, and not have to buy a lot of extra fertilizers. That one. I have a question. How do you keep the rats away when you're from your compost? She's asking how do you keep the rats away from your compost. You have to be careful about putting kitchen waste in there. And depending on where you are, if you, you know, have wildlife that gets into things, then it probably would be better with an enclosed composter. And that would keep the rats from trying to get into it? Well, they can if it's closed up. Keep it closed they up can't up. get into it because you're, it's one of those that you can turn uh, and it's totally enclosed, so they can't. See, I have open ones and I, I like the open ones, but the, the closed ones, because I have raccoons that will come and get into things. But you'll have more chance of them getting in with if you put too much kitchen waste in well, what there. Do you, what do you mean by you mean garbage? What are you your kitchen about? waste? Yes, your peelings. Yeah, I thought you said save that for compost. You do. You can. Don't put too much at one time, oh. and always cover it. Oh. Always, always cover it, your your food waste. Okay. But yes, uh, your kitchen waste is good. Don't no meats, no uh, bones, and uh, no oils. That sort of cooked food generally. No. Uh, but calibrate your spreaders. Uh, we're reducing pollution here. You want to calibrate your spreaders the same as you calibrate sprinklers, but it's a little bit different. And I don't, I'm sorry, I didn't bring you a handout. Uh, most people have a yard service, but have a deflector shield on so you're not throwing out fertilizer into the water bodies or into the streets or onto your driveways. Again, use low maintenance plants and remove uh, or, or uh, use, remove, excuse me, invasives. If you're on a water body, in particular, you do need to have a deflector shield because you're supposed to have a no maintenance zone, and it depends on whether it's a three foot or a 10 foot low maintenance zone based on what your deflector shield or not deflector shield on your, on, and, and if you have a service, they, they are having, they know to do that. Okay, so we, or in a case of plant. You'll be surprised. How many of you have this Mexican petunia? 
everybody. The wildlife love it, don't they? Did you know that that's on the not recommended list? Not recommended. Invasive, not recommended. There are different categories on your invasive plants. There's prohibited, not recommended, caution. So there is a sterile variety called purple. Don't shower. But I tell you, it's by underground runners and it's all over my backyard. So it's, it, to me, it's still invasive. <laughs> yes? Yeah, there is something similar that's a, that's a native. So you have, you, you have to determine which one is the invasive and which one is the non-invasive or the native. I, I'm not familiar with the name. Are you, Terry? Uh, would you know the difference to tell her? The flowers are completely different. They're not as large and showy. My sister can identify. I can't. Yeah. Yeah. No. I. Yeah. I have. I can't even really identify the invasive one uh, against the purple showers, which is a sterile variety. Because they look so much alike to me. Now, here's another one that I bet everybody has or did have at one time. Yeah, the bandana, the beautiful yeah. flowers. See, that's also on the not recommended list. Why? What do you think? The birds love those berries. And they carry them off into the areas that we don't want them to be to have in the Medina. So that's what's happening. What do you know about providing for wildlife? Anybody here have a birdhouse? No, we have a bird Bird baths, okay, bird, bird feeders. Bird feeders. <laughs> bird feeders. How about plant material? You have specific plant material for your butterflies? Yeah, so you've got like four different varieties of milkweed. Okay, she's working with the monarchs with her. She's got the milkweed. All right, uh, anybody else? We all should do something because I think you put pollinators, as you know, we're losing pollinators. So we do need to put in plant material for pollinators. And as, as you hear the beekeepers say, that one third of every bite of food that you take is pollinated by a bee. I also heard that as far as butterflies. More bat. More bat. Bats are also good, at, depending on where they are. So let's plant some good plant material for them. But they, there's only the four things that they need, the food, shelter, space, and water. And in the summertime, water is the most important thing. So always make sure and refill or change out that water so it's not standing. And you see, this was a picture in my backyard. You see the birds they've collected there. They were having a bathing day. They were all chatting, getting together, taking their turns in the bird bath. But think about this, vertical layer is so important for the wild. I should have put in the one picture of my neighbor's yard that has a bird bath sitting right in the middle of the yard. There's nothing. Okay. There's, there's not any bird who's going to be happy going to that bird bath because there's no way to get away from predators. There's no way to get in shelter. And so that's why you need to have vertical layer, different layers of plant material so that they can, I think it's for nesting, they use it for getting out of the, the weather and mating and all, all those things. And you see this guy here, he's trying to take the picture. Okay. Oh. So, thinking of your wildlife, who's the hardest on birds? Cats. Yeah. Cats. So, I think there's a spy among us here. <laughs> so, reduce pesticide use because we need identification of, remember, identification of those bugs and spot tree, and better yet, have a pesticide free zone. Use other methods like picking and, and, and handling, you know, picking off your bugs or, or things that aren't good for your plant rather than just getting on a spray bottle. And so, let's see if your yard speaks Florida friendly. Now, you don't have to admit any of this. Do you have different plant species? Do you select plants for the area? What is our area? What's our zone? 
ninth. It used to be 8 being 9A, and now I think they put us all in 9. Do you have a base of plants? Not sure. Do you scout the yard? See, that's that's the good part there. If you scout your yard on a regular basis, then you'll know. Do you save the rain? Do you have compost? Do you use mulch? Bird feeders? Baths? Calgary sprinklers? Spreaders? And raise your hand if you've had your soil tested. Okay, you should do that one or two times a year. And that's another piece of paper that is in the stack that you should have been given. Is uh, how to take soil samples because it's free. pH and our so if you do all those things, then your yard speaks water friendly. And we have what's called a water friendly yard recognition program. And if anybody's interested, then in Duval County, it has to be Duval County, we have several team members who go out and come around and look at your yard with the checklist that we have from the University of Florida and go through there. And then we give you recommendations, answer questions based on that checklist. And all you have to do is send me an email, call in, and then we get to schedule. Okay? Any questions for me? Yes. I mean, I, are you going to speak to about what our Florida training was? Uh, Terry's oh, okay. Terry's doing plans. Yes. I just want to make a comment that I think that they just made the best of all of us for the yard and for inside. It's all natural and for anything where you know, people's pets and it's set in the house and for the lawn. So it's called Nature's Way.
Uh, so if you're getting ocean water that's coming in, that's a whole different ball game. So then you're also getting salt introduced into that soil. And you can have problems for that. So this is just some basic information over on the right and some links if we ever have to deal with that in our area. So far, we've been very fortunate. Salt spray is probably the thing we have the most problem with. And there you're going to see scorched, dry, burn looking foliage. This is a plant that I have in my yard, and it's a chaste tree, Vitex, and I've got a picture of it later. And it's considered salt tolerant, somewhat salt tolerant, but notice the area that's burned on this side. So that's where the northeast winds are coming from. So this side looks pretty good. So that's way you kind of that way you kind of know that that's from that salt spray that's coming off the ocean. So some plants, even though they have some salt tolerance, they may not be able to handle sustained winds because the salt will build up actually on the plant. So what can you do if you have that happen? You can rinse it. So I, yeah, you can go out and hose it down after that more research. Sometimes though it goes on for days and days, so that, that becomes a problem. So before you purchase your plant, know your plant. Somebody asked about it, my plant it gets too big and then there's a smaller one behind it. So you've really got to do your homework before you go out and purchase that plant. How many people are guilty of going to the nursery and they see something they like and they bring it home? I do the same thing, you know. And then I say, okay, now I look it up and I figure out what am I going to do with this plant? So it, a lot of the plants that builders put in also are large maturing plants. Uh, so they're plants that typically require a lot of pruning. And those are the cheaper plants because they're fast growing plants. So if you're doing your own landscaping, you can select plants that maybe get to the height that you want them to be. And then you're not having to go out and prune them away from the windows or prune them away from the walls of the home. Your termite inspectors don't like those plants on the entrance. So here are some of the things that you can take into consideration. And I'll kind of go through some of these quick. A lot of these you guys are familiar with. So these are the ones that have decent soft tolerance and they're the ones you're going to see typically in the beaches area. So agathanthus or aberrant lily comes in blue or white. That's a popular one. This is one that I always keep in a container at my, the front of my entrance, which faces east, the alyssum. Uh, uh, it's also called lobularia or snow princess. So it's an alyssum that's more heat tolerant. But it does require a lot more water during the hot summer months and some fertilizer too, because it blooms pretty much year round. This one you see in area landscapes, and it's in bloom um, right now. It starts blooming in the winter months, and it stays in bloom throughout. This is not the same thing as the burr owl. This is a different species, so you can't use this for, the, for your burrs. But some of the other aloes would be salt tolerant as well. The angelomia. I've had these. That's the summer snapdragon. So you use this in place of snapdragons during the hot summer months. And I've had some that have been perennials in my front yard for probably three or four years now. They don't need deadheading, uh, and they provide nice color, so you might consider using those for uh, a flowering perennial. Now, we talked about lawn, so what can you do instead of lawn? This is one that is considered somewhat salt tolerant. This is a perennial peanut. It likes full sun. It fixes its own nitrogen, so it needs very little fertilizer. It doesn't need a lot of irrigation. The only negative, you know, one negative would be, is that if we get a hard freeze, it'll turn brown. Uh, but it comes back from the underground root system when we get more weather in the spring. The only other negative would be sometimes it gets weeds. So when you have a dense growth like that, sometimes it's difficult to get nut sedge and things like that out of it. So. And you can see the underground root system that that has. So it does fix its own nitrogen. Uh, so that really makes it a very low care plant. Now I've got one of the butterfly weeds up there, and that's the native milkweed. There's also there's several different types of native milkweed, as well as the Mexican milkweed. So most of you probably have the Mexican milkweed. That's the one that's the two-toned, it's yellow orange flower. And that one receives readily. Uh, this one will actually, it has a strong tap 
root system, and it will die back in the fall, and then it reemerges in the spring. So that way, the monarchs will actually migrate to Mexico or either side of Florida. The Mexican milkweed stays pretty much like a perennial unless we have a hard freeze. Uh, and this year, we did not. So we actually advise that people cut their Mexican milkweeds back about late October or early November so that they're not laying eggs and that they go ahead and continue with their migration. What about time on that, please? Uh, late October, early November. Cut them back. The other thing, the milkweed has that milky sap, so if you're ever working with those and other plants like the agapanthus, make sure you wash your hands and if you're out in the heat, don't wipe your eyes because it can really cause damage to your eyes if you're working with those plants, so be very careful. Bovine is another one. This is a little bit like an aloe. You've probably seen this as a succulent looking plant, very dry tolerant and salt tolerant as well. Now you're familiar probably with the regular bottle brush, which is either there's an erect or there's a weeping bottle brush, it's a tree. This is another one. Uh, all of those are salt tolerant, but this is one called Blue John, and you can use it as a foundation plant in a sunny area. It's absolutely gorgeous. The squirrels shoot my flowers off. Have you guys said that problem? Yes. I come out of all on the ground. So. Now this is one that I have tried. I've seen it at Rock Away and some other nurseries. It's not inexpensive. Uh, but uh, I got it from a local nursery guy and he wanted me to try it. I think it was salt tolerant and it's done wonderful. And it stays low. It's an evergreen, two to three feet tall, so it worked perfect across my entrance. Uh, it doesn't like full sun, so I've got it in an eastern exposure, and that's exactly where I'm getting the salt spray. So it's done wonderful, and I've had it probably for about 10 years. Crinum lilies. If you walk around that year later, you're going to see some of the crinum lilies in bloom. Um, and this particular one is the Ellen Boson kit, and that's the one that's in bloom outside right now. This is the one that's the most popular in our area because it was actually bred in Florida uh, and it's been distributed widely. It's very prolific. So I did talk to one of my master gardeners and she said it was so hardy and so prolific that she pulled all of hers out because it, it does reproduce bulbs quite readily. So you can share them with others, but it requires no care, salt tolerance, dry tolerance. Uh, it works in the rain garden as well. Yes. And the bottom there you said it's toxic. It is. It is toxic. So a lot of the bulbs actually are toxic. Yeah. So if you do have, that's why I've got these in there. You've got the hand bag, which has a lot of the notes, and I'm not reading this verbatim, but you do need to keep that in mind. So they eat the leaves or something? The dog eats the leaves, or you have to eat the bulb? Um, it's. I don't think you're going to get them to to die. It's not like a poopy or something like that, but it is toxic. Yeah. And again, it's a skin area. Remember I mentioned that about the milkweed as well? So these, a lot of those plants that have that sticky sap are here the skin areas. The purple cone flower is a good native uh, and it's salt tolerant. It's a good perennial that will come back. Bush daisy is another small flowering shrub that will do well at the beaches and it pretty much blooms year round unless we get a freeze. Gavardia, blanket flower, I'm sure you're familiar with it. They've done a lot of breeding with this, so it actually, uh, they create some new varieties that are larger flowers and different colors, but this is one that we'll reseed, and it's a great butterfly plant. This one, that one you even see in the dune area, if you notice it coming up on me. This is one I've got in the front, and I've seen this in a lot of beaches landscape. The fire bush, and this is a, again a native. Uh, there's a compact variety, and then there's a taller one, but I will get some burn if I have a strong northeast wind come in. It will sometimes burn back. And this is one that really attracts aphids. So if you notice the leaves are tough or something like that, and when you grow, you might have insects or something feeding on the underside of those leaves. 
Another one which is doom sunflower is a great ground cover uh, and it's very soft tolerant and it will also reseed. Hibiscus, how many of you have hibiscus? That's a popular plant, especially at the beaches. So it's one that really withstands the test of time. The only problem we might have is, other than a few pest problems, if we get no damage on it. And then you have to wait for the new growth to come out to know where to prune it back. Okay, the mock or big leaf hydrangea is another one uh, that's very popular. Ah. The questions that we usually get on this, now oak leaf hydrangea is not salt tolerant, so that's not one that we can plant at the beach. I do have one lace cap that I've had pretty good success with, it's called Lady in Red. It says it's not salt tolerant, but I've had it now for probably about 10 years. And it took a little while for it to adapt. So some plants sometimes have to adapt to the salt conditions. But it's interesting that we are sometimes concerned with whether we want the blue or the pink flowers. So this is just a little bit of information. It's really not necessarily pH related, but it's aluminum that actually changes it from a blue to a pink. So without aluminum, the flower pigment is pink in color. And if you do have, um, let's see, I've got more information on this, on how to change it, it's the slides. So if you have a low soil pH, the aluminum is available for the plant, so you'll automatically get blue flowers. And if you have a high soil pH, the aluminum is tied up in the soil, and then you'll end up with pink flowers. And most of us at the beach are probably going to have a higher soil pH unless you have amended the soil because our soils would run at least six and a half to seven and a half from what we see of people submitting their soil samples. If it's kind of in between and you see some of those at the beach, kind of a purple color, they can't make up their mind if they want to be blue or pink, so they end up with a little purple. Uh, if you have high phosphorus in your soil, so we recommend people not apply phosphorus because our soils are usually very high in phosphorus, it will actually tie up uh, the aluminum. And what number is that on the uh, fertilizer bag? That's the middle one. Thank you. So if you've got three numbers, nitrogen is the first one, phosphorus is the second one, potassium is the last one. So you want low phosphorus. So for lawns and other plants, we usually recommend something like a 16-0-16. Uh, you want equal amounts a lot of times of the nitrogen and the potassium and very low phosphorus. Yeah. So if you want to change your flower color, here's some of the information uh, that you can follow. And this is in your handout. So if you do this, you you will at least end up with blue flowers. I grew up with blue flowers. So I tend to lean towards blue. Up in North Carolina, we had more acidic soil. Uh, if you want pink flowers, you can actually add lime, and that will raise the pH and reduce the availability of the aluminum. So you can do that by using the hydrated lime. Be careful with the hydrated lime. It's a powder, and if you have a cup in your hand or something, it can actually burn you. Um, holly, Yopon Holly is a good native that is very soft tolerant. There's also a smaller version of this called the Shillings Holly that will also work. This is one I've had in my backyard for a while called Justitia or Firecracker Plant and it does quite well. Uh, it's exposed to also the salt spray and attracts hummingbirds. It's got a little bit of fuzzy foliage on it. Tritoma is one or red hot poker that you've probably seen. Make sure you want this one because if you ever have to dig this out, it's, it's really hard to dig out. And my neighbors dug hers out, so that's a picture of her planting. But they really make kind of neat plants. So. Lion's ear is another one. See the orange tufts of flowers? They usually bloom in the fall. It can be a little bit weedy. Uh, they have a large planting, and this is the zoo where it looks very attractive, but it gets six feet tall. 
So that's where you've got to go back to your mature size and check on that. There are lots of different types of lantana. We only recommend the sterile types that do not produce berries. So if it produces berries, typically it is one that can be distributed uh, by birds and taken to other areas. There's also a native uh, lantana as well that you might be interested in. Oh, and I get to see poisonous on that one too. So. This is one that we used to call the wheat, uh, and it's called fog, fog fruit or frog food. It should be fog is what I meant to put on there. Um, but if you look at it, see how the flower looks like the head of a match? It probably corrected it or something for me, maybe in the spelling. Fog's a word too. But this is a native ground cover, and we used to always try and control it in turf areas. Now they are promoting it as a ground cover, and one of the reasons is that it is the larval food source for several butterflies. Uh, so it's a good plant. It's very drought tolerant. It can actually take a little bit of foot, light foot traffic. You can mow it and it stays very low to the ground. It will burner in the other areas, yes. So how do you get them? You, you would have to really go to a native plant nursery uh, or you can find, I see it all over on the side of the road. If you look along the median, you'll see it in the middle of the road. Yes. Is that an okay thing to do? No, you're not supposed to stop. <laughs> you know, I mean, we've actually got it all Right. Right. It's illegal actually to stop and go to people's property and plants with that permission. <laughs> Here's another one. You can do the same thing. So this is the Iron Cup Mimosa. This is another native ground cover. Uh, so right now it's in bloom. It's got these cute little pink blooms. If you touch the leaves, they're also referred to as sensitive plants, so the leaves fold up. Now this one is very aggressive. So if you put this one in, just know that it's going to produce underground runners and it's going to come up in other areas. So you either have to confine it or you have to not worry about it, where it's going. And it, again, fixes its own nitrogen. It's in the lagoon family, so it takes really no water. It grows, again, on the side of the road along with the match weed. A lot of times you see them side by side. There are several different little grasses, muley grass. There's a white and a pink. Yes, ma'am, you have a question? If you know, I want to more of a comment. If when you're out on the highway or the interstate, there's a lot of areas where they have test areas where they don't mow and they've got different things Correct. that are coming to. Right. It's really interesting to see the Yeah, they're doing studies. Um, Dr. Eric Daniels, who is out of Gainesville, who's one of our butterfly guys, uh, he's working with the with DOT, and they're looking at pollinators, and they say if you do not mow, what how much you increase, you know, that was a duh to me, you know, but they got money to actually pay students to go in and count. But I think I could have told them that they would have more pollinators if they didn't mow. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but, but now DOT is convinced, so I think they're going to stop the mowing on the roadsides and stuff. Yeah, so much. Much. yeah, it is very attractive. I know that um, when I go up into North Carolina in particular, they do a great job at the landing there. Yes. So muley grass is a great one. I've got this. The only problem, you know, I prune it once a year and before the new growth comes out, probably in March. There is a mealy bug and we just had it at the office. So if you see little white things along the leaves, you're going to have to just prune it down to the ground and then let it come back uh, from the base. Very hard to control. Pentas are great. Uh, for, and there's all different types of colors. There's even variegated leaves. So that certainly is a good plant. Very dry tolerant and salt tolerant. Lumbago, you see this all throughout the beaches. They do need pruning because they will get large. So you need to just do a little, unless you've got it in an area where you're using it more as a buffer or something like that. But most people will end up pruning it to try and control the size. Portulaca uh, is another one that's a succulent type plant that holds up very well. Rosemary. This one is, 
extremely small tolerant. Other people try and grow it where they've got very organic soils and they can't. But in our sandy soils, it's excellent. And it grows like a weed. So if you use rosemary in cooking, you really shouldn't have some of this in your landscape. Yes? I grew it in a pot and it didn't do, so it's better to put it You're in the You're better off putting it in the ground, put it in full sun, put it where, it, where it's out. Uh, you don't want it in the drip line of the house necessarily, but it needs good drainage. So you may have had too rich of the soil. This one is, there's an upright uh, that you can grow. This is what mine looks like because I put it in the ground and it looks a lot like juniper. And, the, and it only started out as a couple of plants, but what it does, it grows over and it touches the ground and it roots. So it continues to spread. So it's, it's very easy to root when it does that. Uh, and it's got the flowers and this one to me, the creeping one, has a better, it's, it's more succulent for cooking than the upright, oh, the shrubby one. Those the shrubby. Roses do, well, amazingly enough, fairly well at the beach. I've got neighbors that have them. Um, there are problems with most roses. They get chili thrips. My neighbor was out there spraying the other day and he had the canister on and I was going to take my recycling out and it was right by where he was spraying and I said, no, I think I'll even take that later. So, if you, if you don't mind doing the maintenance, even the lower maintenance ones probably will require some work, but you've got the more disease-resistant varieties. I don't know if Marigo is spraying these out here, probably so, but even the drift roses and the knockouts probably take some care, and I know people are having problems with chili thrips and things like that. So, Rosbeckias are also good. Black Eyed Susan, so there's lots of different varieties of those. This is Eddie's favorite plant, the Morelia. Uh, this is the sterile variety, but as she said, it still runners, but it is salt tolerant. There are other new varieties called May, I believe Mayan is what it is, and they are purple, pink, and white, so you may see some different colors on the market, but they still run, but they don't reseed. What do you mean by invasive? And the one that has produces seed is invasive because birds can take the seed and they can put it in natural areas. This one will not move unless you've got it close to a natural area where it would run them. So it's not considered invasive if they're sterile. It's the same way with the Nandinas. There's new varieties of Nandina that don't produce berries anymore. So they're not considered invasive. Here's another one that you see probably a lot at the beach. It's very uh, salt tolerant. It's a firecracker plant. Uh, and it, it basically weeps, has very small modified leaves, uh, but it's great tubular flowers for hummingbirds and things like that. Your palmettos, of course, are there's only a few palms that are considered really super hardy for salt. And uh, it's mainly the palmettos and cabbage palm and some different varieties of those. So I was surprised when I started looking that up. The salvia, uh, lots of salvias will work. This is one of my favorites, the Mystic Spires Blue that I've kept for years and years and it's a perennial and you just have to keep it pruned back and fertilize it to keep it uh, functional. They use this on golf courses a lot, sometimes in medians, the sand cord grass. So that's certainly a good one. Uh, it tolerates drought or flooding, either one. Soaps Aster is another one that's a native perennial that you can grow. Society Garlic is another good one. You don't want to put it by your front door so that your visitors brush it on the way in, but you can use it in other locations. So the bulbs and leaves are edible as long as you are growing it like an edible plant, too. So it does double as a food source. I've got this around my driveway. This is a dwarf Vakahatchee grass. There's also a standard Vakahatchee that's much taller. This one stays about three to four feet tall. Uh, Vinca is another one that you see throughout a lot of land. It gives you a lot of color, probably the most color uh, of anything that you could put in right now, I think, for summer months. So this would be a good choice and it's salt tolerant.